What, what I will talk about is then this PIAC, the program for the international assessment of adult competencies. And many of you, or some of you have heard about this for some years now. It's something that where the background work started already in 2002, with meeting after meeting, developing tests. And it, it, it goes back and it builds very much on some earlier work that had been done on the international assessment of, of uh, international comparison of adult literacy and you remember all the big hype in Canada that a certain, I mean, half of the Canadian population was, didn't have the literacy skills to uh, uh, join the, 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 the more productive part of the labor force. So, so, so for, and, but behind this is, is, is then a certain movement that I will talk a little bit later about. And when I present this today, it's new work that, that we have done in the center yet. We have been done quite a lot of work earlier on the other literacy, and I've been a little bit involved in some of the background material on the questionnaire at one time, and I've kind of followed it. But when I present results later, and I have some beautiful slides that I actually have borrowed particularly from William Thorne, who is at, at the OECD, and they're very happy for us to, to, to use their slides. And some of you who were at the release might have seen some of them. I will just try it. So what I will try to do is to put a certain spin on, on, on some of these things, but particularly give some information and hopefully see if, if you want to get involved in, in running the data, because this time the data is actually available. I mean, you can go into the website as you can for the PISA, and you can get the handle of the data, and you can run it in your SPSS or, 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 or SAS. So it's, it's very different. And in that way, it lends itself uh, for kind of being used by different NGOs in a way that we, they haven't, one hasn't been able to do it before. So, and th this is kind of important. But if we look at it, you know, some of you have heard about PISA. And so what happened now is that the OECD has kind of moved within its, its overall skills strategy or skills program. They have three components now. They have the PISA, the PIAC, and what they call the skills strategy, which is more to give policy recommendation. And, and one thing to observe about this is that all of a sudden, kind of education as we know it, appears less and less as a word. What we talk about is skills and skill strategy. And for you, those of you who are interested in discursive analysis, that is an interesting shift. Uh, we find, you know, we, we, we had reports on, on comparison of, of adult learning, but now all of this gets, you know, kind of appears under these skill strategies where education and things are, 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 are there. But anyway, the the difference with PISA is kind of easier to get one's head around because, I mean, it is to, to, to look at ways in which students can learn better, teachers can teach better, schools can operate more efficiently, so one can speak to it. Where PIA comes in, it looks at adults, and that's how we use skills and benefits gain, but it means that the context of where the skills are being generated is much vaguer. I mean, when we look at PISA, 50-year-old, they are kind of, I mean, some people would say that they are locked, in, locked into schools. Other ones would say they have the benefit of attending schools. Uh, but th th they are there, and, and we can talk, we can relate it to teacher education, we can relate it to uh, assessment in schools. But it gets very complicated in when we come into PIAC, because if you think about yourself, ourselves, where do we pick up our competencies? I mean, we know we do it in schools, but we also do it in other places. And I, so I, will, I will talk about that a little bit. And so PIAC looks at how skills are, are used at home, in workplaces, and in the community, and how these skills are developed, maintained, and lost over a lifetime, and how they then relate to labor market, different labor market outcomes. So in that way, the context is very different while the, 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 the kind of this, and the assessments are done a bit differently, while the overall issue about the competences are very similar. So he, here is the ambition of PIAC, uh, you know, to, 
identify and measure different individuals in countries, I mean, which underlines both personal and society success. So we make this assumption here is that what we measure actually says something about these things. It will tell us about how successful you are uh, and how this kind of the impact this has on social, uh, or, or on both on the individual and countries. So you will read, you know, that some countries are ranked higher in some ways than other countries. But then they also say that they will under, try to kind of look at the performance of education and training system, workplace practices and social policies and generating required competence. And then to help clarify and give recommendations. And this is what you can, you know, this is what one can hear OECD has said. Or you can find that, you can find, I mean, those of you who work in the field here in literacy know how very quickly some of this language is then picked up, lowered down, and used sometimes in a very, not a very, very productive way. For example, earlier to tell, you know, tell literacy programs that should evaluate according to the, the skills measures. So they have an enormous impact how they work themselves through the system and how they are understood. Uh, I mean, th this is a, a tall order, and the, the, I think one of the reasons, I mean, it, it, that it's cost like that is that you have to convince countries to put in millions and millions and millions to get this data. I mean, now we'll come to it later, but there were 166,000 individuals that have been tested and interviewed. But I mean, to, and, and I, I remember when they were trying to do this, and, how, and they sold it very much to the ministries particularly under C and D. I mean, it's the economists and the labor market people that are interested in, in A and B. But in order to get it done, it really depends on how well they can deliver on C and D. So here is what something I call overselling PIAC. If you look at some of the earlier be, be, background documents, I mean, this is a level what they, if not promised, they hinted that we could, one could deliver. I mean, for example, you know, if you are sitting in a ministry and you wonder that should I pay for six months of early childhood or should I rather pay for some or, or finance some adult education. So, I mean, the notion is here that the data and that what we do in these kind of studies should ultimately be able to feed some insight in, in, into things like that. And if you look at the original data collection amb ambition was to test to have the, 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 the testing that we got, to have the individual survey that we have, but it was also to have a workplace survey where the inside the workplace could actually study and, and get data on how people use skills, how the work was, was constructed, and then collection of administrative and policy data from countries. Because as it is now, it's really up to the researchers, if you want to do it, to say, I'm interested in this, I want to take a look at some countries and find. But there's no way that the OECD or anyone else can, from the data, in any detail, give talk about the policy levers and so things without the other two. But they were scrapped, I mean, because of financial reasons and others. And I think that's important to remember when we look at what the ambition was. And I know at least in the in, in, in some places, I mean, they, they're a bit concerned about this, but, but, but they were. So th this is a little bit just a bit back. So uh, as you can understand now, I mean, th this is situated in an economic discourse. Uh, and here, I mean, we have education as a production function. One looks at workers' characteristics, uh, how productive they are, and then at outcomes, you know, like wages, salaries, and national prosperity. I mean, that is the logic of the production function. That is the logic behind PIAC, and that's logic behind much of the discussions about what, what where education plays in today. Uh, there, there's one very, I mean, I've said here that, and this is something we can see in the 1980s. Uh, in the beginning, there was almost an exclusive focus on supply of skilled workforce and not demand. Supply meaning, you know, that we could have an uh, announcement like Canada Lex or BC Lex, these kind of skills. There was very, very little discussion on what do we really demand? I mean, what is really needed? And the fact that it's not a constant. 
what, one of the interesting things you will find when you read, I, I will give you some references later, the PIAC report now, is much more of a shift in understanding on how skills are embedded, how work is structured. I mean, that's something that the kind of the sociologist or people studying work had said from the beginning. I mean, how, how work is done. But there is an understanding now that it depends also what happens inside workplaces, how you organize your work. You can organize your work that you use skills to a larger extent or to a smaller extent. And you might choose to organize your work depending on what kind of skill structures you have. For example, if you look at the first kind of economic revolution of Japan in the 1960s, that was achieved not with so much of, of, of high skills. It's a very, very skillful way of using organized work in ways that didn't make that demand. So th th that discourse is here. And I just put the next. The interesting thing, I mean, if you look at this, this Julenhammer is an interesting man because he was the, he was the CEO of Volvo, but he was the, also the CEO of the European Round Table of Industrialists. And he said in 1982 in a meeting, when learning, learning becomes profitable, to be there, yeah, uh, we capitalists must become humanists, which is uh, quite true. But I want to now to go here, the first, take a bit of results before I come. I will say more about the testing was done later. But I just want to come back because this is so central in their argument about skills and skills lack. And this is, you can see I always refer to this Thorne. He has kind of looked at the data. And OECD has two, two measures. They have the qualification and skilled. And the way that you measure qualification is that you compare a person's educational level to the job classification and what it is supposed to, to, to take. And skill is that you, there is in the PIAC a question around uh, uh, do you have the skills to do your work? Do you have the skills to do work that is a bit less uh, demanding, a little more demanding? And then one looks at the actual skills that the person had has and what the skills is for that group of people that, that would fall in there. So you have two measures. But I mean, the, the only thing to show here is that, as you can see, in most countries, there is more uh, 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 overskilled than underskilled people in, in our economies, in, in the OECD economies. If you take, for example, a country like Korea, uh, and you can go, to, go down to Austria under the skilled side, it is very, very overskilled compared to uh, the number of people that don't have. So the, the, if we look at this kind of data, and then it means that the dis, that is partly why the discourse has changed to a co discourse of mismatch. People might have skills, but they don't have these skills that are needed, which, which makes it a bit more refined and a, a little bit different. But I think th this is an, a kind of an important part because it kind of, it speaks a little bit against the overselling of the whole skills notion that OECD is around. The, 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 the thing when they undermatch is that that really doesn't speak to what they're using. That just speaks to how well, in some ways, the, the, the classification system measures what it's supposed to measure. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's, I think, why. I mean, this is the strength of the PIAC that we go away, or even for all this, we go away from subjective measures to to more trying to measure what people are doing. But th this is just to, to, to get us into the mood. Uh, <laughs> and so the, we, we have a, a, the target population, I mean, just a very short, 16 to 65. Uh, and they interview people irrespective of nationality, citizenship, and language status. And, and you, you, they, they, they control for that later, but that's important. Uh, the official language, uh, so in some countries if there are two official languages or three, I mean they, they, they do that. Sample size vary from about 4,500 to 27,000. I think Canada has, Canada oversampled a lot, partly because Canada has been driving this and partly because Canada really wants to see what happens on a regional basis and has to invite it. Uh, that, when I say that the data is available, it's the international data that's available. To run the Canadian data, we have to do that through later. When it will be released, it will be able to be done. So it's difficult to talk too much about 
you know, breaking it down to the level of, of, of uh, bigger communities or regions in the international data. For that we have to look at the Canadian. And the data, the survey is, is um, done in people's home and they use laptop computers which is I mean, interesting. And if you can't handle a laptop computer, then they use a paper version, depending on the computer skills. But in that way, they can create situations that is quite real in how people use and, and decode information. Uh, the other thing that might be important to note, that there's no time limit. So if you come home and a person needs eight hours and they're nice to you, they allow you eight hours. So the speed factor is not playing itself out to, 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 to a large extent. And then a little bit about the, 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 the uh, processing they have. And, and now I'm into something which I really know. I mean, you know, I've run this data and I've looked at it, but th th these are things that for people who are really, really, I mean, knowledgeable about numeracy, literacy, how you measure it. And we know from earlier that in the Isles, in the Canadian literacy community, there were strong uh, kind of feelings about the, some of the limitations about the test. What's interesting here is that they have done quite a lot of more work since last time. And particularly they have developed partly new instruments to measure what is at the, 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 the what's called the very low literacy levels. Uh, they, they, they have a new test. But it's not, I mean, so if you look at the literacy, they don't measure the writing skills in literacy. But uh, it's, it's, they also look at the, the cognitive strategies. How do people decode in real situations? And uh, it's interesting, I mean, it, it would be interesting to see how the reaction would be when people have it, more time to, to, to look, look into it. Uh, so it, it, it also looks at, for example, reading digital text, text contained in hypertext, navigation features, scrolling and clicking, and then linking up. I mean, that's how we do. And they look at how well people handle that. And they look at the functional. When, when you have these scores, the scores are then developed into a, a set of different levels. And for literacy, there are six levels. One level is actually below level one, that means it's so low you can't really assess it. And then you have level one, two, three, and four and five are grouped together. And these levels actually are not only numerically different, they are particularly supposed to describe things that are um, uh, different levels of operating at things. So they, are fund they, 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 they bring up fundamentally different competencies at, at different levels. And, and one very big difference to last time is that what really got the hype last time was that OECD and the reporter time came out and say that people need to be at level three to be kind of fully functional in the modern economy. Uh, and there was a kind of a, a scream against this because they had nothing to stand on behind that. So this year they, uh, they don't they don't, there's nothing in the first report they talk about that you must have level three, and that's probably why there wasn't very much uptake in the Canadian press on the release of the, 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 the thing. It could pass, I mean, without uh, too much. Uh, the other thing they have here is, is, is numerous, numeracy, uh, which, which involves managing a situation, or solving a problem in a real context by responding to mathematical information represented in multiple ways. And this is actually better. The numeracy test last time was awful. And it everything grouped up in one. This, this time it looks better. And then they have one new test, which you are very proud of. And that is the uh, using digital, I mean, you know, problem solving in technology rich environments. And this, of course, speaks to uh, uh, the, the whole uh, of, of ICT. And, 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 and that form of, of uh, uh, literacy. But it actually goes further than, than computer literacy because it has also a cognitive function and it looks to at how people. So the, 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 these are the, some of the main tests. But then in addition to the tests, they have in the questionnaire, they use uh, use of skills at work or, or, or at home. And so what they ask people about is that 
how they, uh, what, what tasks do they really perform? And how often do they perform the task? And by describing the task, they assume, I mean, the, the assumption is that one will get a better indication of people's literacy competencies than what we have had before when they ask, can you do this? Do you feel that you have too little? And, and it's particularly, I mean, they, they work in, in the UK with a job requirement approach that have come quite far. So we have that in, 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 in the measurement. I mean, then, then we get some of the big messages, I mean, you know, skill transforms life and drives economy, what people know and can do impact, impact on their life chances. And of course, on the average, as proficiencies increase, I mean, the chance of being in the labor force, being employed, wages associated with well-being. And, and this is presented at the overall, I mean, with 166,000. And, I mean, it's not strange that we get these results. I mean, they, they are rather self-evident in, in, in some ways. The, the more interesting thing is that why do they look so different in different countries? And, and, and how does it play out? And what can we really learn? Because, I mean, uh, it's not in all the countries that these kind of trends are so strong. And particularly what they don't ask you, answer, and which is the question that if, if we see a relationship between, let's say, this proficiency and people's labor market and so on, if it now increases this group B that are below, if they come here, will they automatically have the same outcomes of their, their proficiencies. Because we know from the literature that we can have two people with the same kind of uh, capital in skills, but they have very, very different outcomes. I mean, with the discrimination. And I mean, there's a recognition of that in the report, of course, that they recognize that, particularly if we look at women, I mean, women have about the same skills competences as men, but their outcomes in terms of economic outcomes are, are, are much less. So, I mean, it's not that easy to say that you bring people up. What they don't answer and what is left for, for I mean, for the broader discussion is that under what conditions do these competences allow a person to move up or to gain? I mean, that's something that, that one has to ask, and, 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 and it may be, I mean, maybe one shouldn't ask that from, 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 from from data like this, it gives a possibility. Then start, let's start to look a little bit at the, 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 the countries here. And I don't know it's how well they show. <laughs> so you can see here, I mean, you know, we have, the, the, they, they've been careful in this one to show it in alphabetical order and not completely. What we can show is, I mean, you can see the countries where there's blue. Blue means that you are significantly above the average. and. Then we have this kind of a gray that really doesn't show up here very well. Uh, that, that, that's where you are kind of uh, not say the white, not significantly. And then you see the, the, um, this one significantly below. Because of the gray. The gray, exactly. And it doesn't show so well here. But if you look at there are a couple of countries that, that, that are high. Uh, Japan. Finland, I mean, the, I mean, Finland we could expect it before, Japan too, we have uh, uh, Australia doing well on two, Sweden shows up and the Netherlands, they are doing well on all of them. I mean, there, there are some of the ones we, we, we could expect. We will find that the United States is not doing that well, they are below the, the average, why Canada is about average in, 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 in most things most of these scores. Uh, I mean, that just gives a little bit a kind of a, a, a general way of describing this. So we can, can see that the uh, United, Sta uh, United States is below this one, is below one on actually everything. It doesn't show. No, it shows here. I can, I have got, you know, I got like this, unfortunately, it, it's not a good thing. Uh, Poland is below, uh, Italy is really below. Yeah. It's interesting that, that um, yeah. so we, we, we get a, a kind of a, an overall, a general kind of, so, so what I will do is that I will just take this as, as a given just now, that, that we have certain national differences, 
And then comes the question that partly also, why do we have these national differences and what, 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 what consequences will they have? I will just I will take away this. Then we can look at inequalities. So we find very high social inequalities uh, in England, Germany, po Poland, and United States. That is to say that the the proficiency scores are very much linked to family background, to socioeconomic status. While we have low scores in Japan, Australia, the Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden. Uh, the and this actually mirrors the PISA distribution. When I start to look at some of these scores, they, they will create a problem, at least for me, in the sense that if you work with a kind of a strong notion of welfare state uh, models, I mean, I usually, and the work we have done, has very often related these outcomes to, to, to welfare state. And in the, in the International Literacy Survey, it came out very beautifully that we found, you know, the Anglo-Saxon countries, which have a high general inequality and also high literacy or proficiency. The, uh, the continental, well, continental European welfare state was somewhere in between. And then we have the, uh, the, the Nordic, uh, and, and, and including Holland, being quite high. Now, I mean, Australia shows up in low inequalities, I mean, they, 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 which is kind of rather interesting. While Germany here have quite high inequalities. So in some ways, I mean, and, and this too early, I mean, I, I would like, to, we have to look at that much more. But some of the results, when they start to show up, are not as clearly divided as we could think from some of the other thing, uh, things we have, have, have looked at. So th this is the kind of the first about the national inequalities. We might look at things like the, you know, what, if we look at some different groups, what happens with the native and the non-native. And this slide shows the score point differences. And the blue points, the blue kind of uh, stars, they indicate when one has adjusted for some of the background material. I don't think that many people would have expected Sweden to be the country which here would have the largest difference between uh, the native and the foreign born. Uh, it doesn't surprise you? No. No? No, not from, not from Muslims, really. no. I mean, so, so what you have here is, because, I mean, they didn't have that when we looked, I mean, earlier. Uh, and we can find, for example, you know, their country like the Czech Republic or Slovak, Slovak uh, that, that have much smaller. Australia has a relatively small. And what, the, what this actually starts to indicate is that what we can read here is a difference in countries' immigration policy. Australia has a very, very strict, as Canada has, although Canada, uh, policy on uh, taking high quality, you know, to apply in, you apply in, and, and you come in to a large extent as, 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 uh, to, the work, to the workforce. While a country like Sweden and also Finland have mostly a refugee influx. So, I mean, later we're very, very interesting for those uh, looking at this from the point of view, who are the people and where do they come from? This actually also started, which is not the thing for this seminar, but some of you might kind of have, have noticed that last year there were in Sweden some um, riots, which was totally unheard about, I mean, mirroring a little bit what happened in Paris. And this actually starts to speak to that, because you have a lot, you have, s and, and when we talk about immigration, you know, Canada is not that uh, different, I mean, it's, it's higher. Canada has 20% in the PIAC of people not born in, 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 in Canada. 20% of the people in this sample is not born in Canada. Actually, that, that's the official figure for 22%. A country like Sweden has 16% not born in the country. And, and this has changed very drastically. So, so. But it, it starts to speak to the dilemma for some of these countries that have been very generous to take refugees. I mean, this is refugees particularly from Somalia, Iraq, Syria, and all of these things. And the enormous challenges, particularly, for, so that, that's one thing for those people who are interested in, in the, 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 this kind of thing. The other thing I, I want to talk a little bit about also when we head the countries and what will happen. This data starts to help us a little bit with that. So we have data from, you know, from, from 16 and up to 65. 
the way that the labor force gets renewed is primarily by people leaving work being less skilled than people that come in. I mean, that is, I mean, since the Industrial Revolution, particularly how, and with the schooling system, how labor forces have been renewed, people leave with less education. Then we also have to remember that in the, from the 1960s on, there's been an expansion in the education system that actually started at different levels at different countries. I mean, you know, North America, United States, and then Canada, we were very rapid with having a, uh, everyone going through uh, elementary school, high school, and now very large groups going to post-secondary. Other countries started a bit later. And this can be read in this graph. Here there's a comparison about literacy skills in younger and older. And younger are the uh, uh, 16 to 24, 25, and the older ones are the uh, uh, 55 to 65. So if you look at, for example, the UK, you can see that the literacy, the, the competences in the younger population and the older population is more or less the same, which means that the UK will not get any advantage, well not any, I mean, but they, they look to get a very small advantage by the kind of the normal circulation we have out of the labor pool and into the labor pool. Well, if you look at a country like Korea, you know, they, they will have an enormous advantage, if, at least if we believe in this kind of way of thinking economically. And the reason for that is, of course, that in Korea, the uh, extension of the school system happened very late. So we have in the group of people to six, 55 to 65, about 85 percent that never didn't have any secondary education. Uh, but but th this is actually something that, uh, th these are the kind of results that were picked up in the UK. If you look at the press releases from the UK, this is the one that's being highlighted. Because, I mean, first of all, we know that the UK did, didn't do that fantastically on an overall score, which means that they, they don't have a, 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 an advantage in, in the present competences if they wanted to organize their work in a different way. Uh, while uh, uh, other countries, I mean, Canada is somewhere in between. US, is, is, US also has the same problem. Not only do they have low overall, but it's not big, big differences. While Finland, already doing very well, will be a country that, that, that will benefit tremendously too as we go forward. And I think this is one interesting way of, of look that the data shed some light on things, that, 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 that what happens. The, the other thing one can look at is the role of formal education. I mean, we often, we, we more or less see the, the formal education as a way of increasing these kind of competencies. So if you have more schooling, you will, uh, you, you, you will kind of do better. Uh, and, and we can see that it doesn't play the same role in all kinds. I mean, it may, might play the same role, but it doesn't come out statistically as the same way in different countries. So for example, in Canada, US, uh, it's very important, but it's less important in Australia, Finland, Japan, Italy. That is to say, when I say it's less important, it means that people, the differences with people with the kind of a post-secondary education in some ones with the elementary or high school education is smaller in these countries. So you could say that in these countries, the proficiency is higher than it, in brackets, should be in some groups, or it's lower in some group than, than, than it should be in Canada. Uh, for example, the United States ranks, uh, ranks much higher uh, level of formal qualification than in numerous illiteracy and problem-solving skills. And so how should we interpret that? Should we interpret that, that they are people are held in formal education, but it doesn't seem to pay off. It doesn't lead to anything. Is there something wrong with the system? Or, or it may not be something wrong with the system at all. It may be uh, 
but it, it's even among the young people that, that this comes out. And then we have the Jap I mean, same thing they have the Japanese, J Japanese and Dutch. And this actually leads, I mean, something that, that we are interested in here is that what is it then? How do people get skills? I mean, how do they get these competences? What is it in our everyday life that we live? I mean, if you really take this notion of lifelong learning serious, and we, we have this notion about not only the organized formal and the non-formal, but also the notion that people can learn in everyday life and, and how things are, are organized. Does this data tell us anything about that? And it tries to do it. But I would try to argue that the results are very kind of perplexing in some, some, some ways. Because what we would expect now is that countries like Japan, uh, Finland, uh, Sweden, somehow people ought to be engaged in their workplaces and, and, and other places very much in, 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 in this, where they measure through these questions around learning, I mean, how people, the people kind of pick up and learn in different places. We would have workplaces that were organized in ways that really made high demand of it. And, and there, there are a couple of data slots here. So if you look at participation rates in, 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 in adult education, and this is actually something where the survey is not good, and some other surveys, they have defined, defined adult education in a rather, both in a very, either in a very broad way or a very narrow way, focus on what is happening at work. The notion is that it's more important what you learn at work than you learn in, in adult education outside, which is absolutely no evidence for that. Uh, I mean, you know, so, so but it, it, it is again, but if you look here, I mean, if you take a country like uh, uh, Japan, I mean, it doesn't have a, if you, if you look at Japan here, it's not particularly high. I mean, Finland is very high, but the, uh, the USA is quite high. So, I mean, what it indicates is that, obviously, the, the data that we have here does not seem to pick up things that in, in many ways can explain why, you know, what has been learned in, in a more formal way, I mean, a formal, in, in a more organized way, outside schools and later. Uh, the, the, the Scandinavian countries are always high, but the total has now become so high, you know, that some groups are up to 80, 90 percent, mm -hmm. that you wonder a little bit what, what it captures. Mm -hmm. But I mean, th th this one does not help to, to, to explain. I mean, so we could have the notion that people maybe hadn't got so much in the formal education system during schooling, but they would later in life have taken all these courses. Uh, I mean, the OECD makes some kind of a comment that uh, uh, it is linked to participation, if you take the whole sample, that people who have higher uh, participation have higher literacy scores. But if you look inside the countries, it's not that clear and, 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 and not that convincing. If you look at this, I mean, what, one of the things that, I mean, has been used to explain, for example, the uh, difference between PISA and PIAC is the notion that people lose skills, they don't use skills, and, and, and they, 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 they disappear. So here is one of the things, you know, reading at work, writing at work, numeracy, and here are just a couple of countries that happen to be on this slide. We will have to look at more. But Japan is interesting. I mean, it's there. And, you know, Japan is not that outstanding in, in, in these things. It's not like there's any indication here that the, the, the way that they have indicators on the use of skills in work would explain their very high levels of proficiency and the fact that the high level of proficiency is quite higher than the education, formal education system. I mean, so I mean, one can draw two conclusions, either that the measures as such are not that good as one had hoped for in the fact that they, they maybe pick up too much on the kind of the quantitative use and not the quality of the use that is being made. And this is where the survey from the workplace would have been so good to have, because then, then they, they, they were supposed to have been, been, been balanced. But, and here's another one that picks up a few other things that, 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 that happens in work, you know, uh, learning, I mean, to what extent are they involved and in, 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 in learning. And in fact, Japan is, 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 is rather low than high 
in, 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 in menu or in the medium. So that doesn't explain much of that either. Uh, volunteering. Uh, here actually is more to look at the differences and what odds ratios is a way of doing kind of doing uh, uh, multiple regressions when one has data of a certain kind. And what one does is that one identify one group and say that uh, let's say that in, in the, the, this time, uh, the, this way, uh, we, we can look at those that are. Uh, the reference group is level one or below. So if they are have, have if we said put a one for them, how much more likely is it that someone from, for example, someone with a literacy level five doing doing volunteer work? Well, one of the things we notice directly in mean, here is that in Canada, there's quite quite major differences. They are much smaller in Japan uh, and in the which could speak to the, the thing that at least the and, and now I would have needed to have which I don't have the total I mean how I mean it can be very equal because people don't do it very much or can be equal because it's high but at least what it seems like is that it's not as dependent on your skills level as it is in, in, in Canada and there's actually quite a lot of data that indicating that in Canada and United States that voluntary work and how it's set up is actually very kind of socially class based that, that how people work there are few groups they, they, much more so than another country but so this speaks more actually to what role can voluntary work theoretically play in, in, in getting these kind of overall skills that's here. I mean, so where I've taken my kind of reports, I mean, there are two main reports from the OECD that you can get from the web. The, the first results, and then there is a technical report where the pre-publication is available. It's 801 pages. Mm -hmm. But um, for those that are very interested in the, I mean, you know, from how the assessment has been done, it's really, really helpful. The first one has, has data, but then particularly, I mean, as, as some of you were at the Center for Literacy, they've done an excellent work by, I mean, they took the lead already a couple of years ago to have public debates around the International Adult Literacy Survey, and they've had fora about this, and they have a, a blog and, and a website where one can, where you can find much of the material. And, and much of the discussion, I mean, discussion takes place that you, you, it's really, really useful and, 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 and worthwhile. But um, to, to round up then, that I mean, the, this is a, a rich material that where one has to kind of, uh, kind of embrace with a kind of a recurring uh, kind of a philosophy. On one hand, one has to be emphatic, I mean, or, or, or two, the effort that has gone in to the richness of the data, but at the same time one should also be suspicious. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, this is a thing. Because it, it, when you get in behind, it's not that easy to draw, to get justification for all these kind of big claims. And you will find very quickly now that I've seen a couple of PowerPoints for people going around in Canada where they just take this and they say, you know, for example, I mean, New Brunswick or Newfoundland or, or uh, BC could really develop if they do this and that. And then they also start now to, you know, involve a little bit of more modern brain research that if you come to level three, you involve, you use your front of your globe of your brain and things. So it, it's this kind of, but anyway, th this is, this is just more to get those of you who knew very little about it to, to kind of see what's happening and uh, then have a discussion.